Our Father in heaven, we ask that you would bless the words that our pastor is about to speak, that you would be with him in body and in mind and in spirit, that you would give him wisdom as he expounds the word today. We ask that for those who are here who have not repented and turned away and been given a heart of flesh, that you would make today that day whether it be an unbeliever among us or the children in our midst, that this would be the day that their hearts were broken and turned to you. We ask these things in the name of your Son. Amen. As you take your seat, will you turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm number 9. Psalm number 9. It is good to be reminded as we look at, at each and every psalm that these, these psalms, this, this entire book of, of 150 psalms is, is a great gift to us as, as, as God's people. The psalms teach us. In many ways, they teach us and assist us in offering praise that, that we can be confident is pleasing to God because these are his own words as we pray and sing these back to him. And other times, the Psalms help to give voice to us, to give voice to sorrows and anxieties and fears that are inexpressible otherwise. In fact, Paul instructs us. He tells us the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings, too deep for words, and he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. You realize that the Psalms are one of the means that the Holy Spirit uses to intercede for us and to instruct us in how to pray as we ought to pray. It doesn't mean that there's some sort of cosmic download that happens to us as if we have this special spirit language in which we pray. That's not the case at all. And one of the means that the spirit fulfills exactly what Paul has said here is as we pray and we sing the Psalms. Now, not only do the Psalms help us expressing ourselves in praise and thanksgiving, not only do they help us in lament or in confession but also they instruct us, they teach us, they help to shape our minds in specific ways in terms of how we ought to pray in certain circumstances. And I'm convinced Psalm 9 is a good example of this. Psalm 9 is a good example of, of a psalm that instructs us how to pray in the midst of certain circumstances. Now we see here that throughout the Psalm 9, we're going to note that David uses words like the wicked, oppressed, trouble, an enemy. And that list goes on. But these are, these, are, these are words that are loaded with darkness, with difficulty, with sorrow, with danger. And how do we approach such hardship? How do you, as, God's, as, as, a, as a son or daughter of the king, call upon the Lord in the midst of affliction, betrayal, Grief, fear, anxiety. You know, it should not be the case that we wait until such circumstances come to us to ask the question, how should we pray now? Doesn't it stand to reason that we would be well suited, it would be much to our profit if we prepared in advance for what we're told in the Scriptures is sure to come to us? All who seek to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. That's a promise. So doesn't it make sense that if that's the, the destiny for all of us at one time or another, doesn't it make sense that we ought to train in advance for that? I saw a video just yesterday. It's a, it's a very tragic event. Perhaps you saw it. A passenger plane just fell from the sky in Brazil on Friday. 
it went into what's called a spin stall. And I, and I read something very fascinating. Over 60 people perished in this crash. Just tragic. But afterward, I, I was reading a very interesting description from a pilot who, who described that every pilot undertakes training from the very first hours, from the very first time in a simulator, the very first time in the cockpit, even before they get in a cockpit, the issue of a stall is important. It's front and center. And the reason this pilot said, the reason this has to be trained is because in a stall, your natural instinct is to pull back on the stick when what you have to do to get out of a stall is to push forward. It's the exact opposite of your instinct. And I thought, you know, so Psalm 9 is in the back of my head as I'm, as I'm reading this. And I think, you know, this kind of training was crucial because your human instinct is to do one thing when what will actually rescue you is to do something else. In fact, precisely the opposite. Do you find yourself praying sometimes in opposite ways of what the scriptures actually tell you to pray for? Psalm 9 is, is, is a helpful corrective to us and instruction to us. In 1 Timothy 4, Paul says in verse 8, for bodily exercise profits a little. He's not saying don't exercise. Don't take care of your body. He said it profits a little. But godliness is profitable for all things, having promise of this life that is now is and that which is to come. And then Peter says something very similar. He says, therefore, in 1 Peter 1, 1 Peter 1, 13, therefore, gird up the loins of your mind or preparing your minds for battle, be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. What does that look like, saints? What does that look like to prepare your mind for action? I love that image, to gird up the loins of your mind. Mentally, tuck your skirts in your robe, in the belt of your robe, so that you're free and unencumbered, and you can run, and you can fight. How do we do that? How do we train ourselves for trouble that is going to surely come? Now, I'm persuaded that Psalm 9 may be of tremendous help to us for just such a thing. To train ourselves in godliness. It's a help to us in the sense of girding up the loins of our mind so that, not if, but when the day of adversity comes, we will already know how to pray. We will already have been trained how to rest securely in the blessed name of our triune God. And I think this is precisely what David's doing here in Psalm 9. This is a Psalm of David. I've entitled the sermon this morning, The Power of a Good Memory. The Power of a Good Memory. By that, I don't mean the power of a memory, which is good, although that's true, but the power of possessing a good memory. Now, what do I mean by that? I think as we see in Psalm 9, three things that David does. We see that he remembers what Yahweh has done. He uses the word recount all of your wonderful deeds. So he remembers all the things that Yahweh has already done. And then secondly, we'll see that David also remembers, more importantly, who Yahweh is. He looks not only at the deeds of Yahweh, what he has done, but who is this God that I serve? And then lastly, and we see this in the, in the, in the final two verses, David shifts his focus forward. He remembers what Yahweh has promised yet to do. So we can think about this very simply, back, up, and forward. He, he remembers backwards at what God has already done. He remembers upward, who God is, and forward. What has God promised yet to accomplish? So let's read together the psalm, beginning in, if I'll read the heading, and then I'll read through the end of Psalm number 9. This is the word of God. To the choir master, according to Muthlaben, a psalm of David. I will give thanks to Yahweh with my whole heart. I will recount all your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and exult in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. When my enemies turn back, they stumble and perish before your presence. For you have maintained my just cause. You have sat on the throne, giving righteous judgment. You have rebuked the nations. You have made the wicked perish. You have blotted out their name forever and ever. 
the enemy came to an end in everlasting ruins. Their cities you rooted out, the very memory of them has perished. But Yahweh sits enthroned forever. He has established his throne for justice, and he judges the world with righteousness. He judges the peoples with uprightness. Yahweh is a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. And those who know your name put their trust in you. For you, O Yahweh, have not forsaken those who seek you. Sing praises to Yahweh who sits enthroned in Zion. Tell among the peoples his deeds. For he who avenges blood is mindful of them. He does not forget the cry of the afflicted. Be gracious to me, O Yahweh. See my affliction from those who hate me. O oh, you who lift me up from the gates of death, that I may recount all your praises. Then in the gates of the daughter of Zion, I may rejoice in your salvation. The nations have sunk in the pit that they made, in the net that they hid. Their own foot has been caught. Yahweh has made himself known. He has executed judgment. The wicked are snared in the work of their own hands. Higayon, Selah. The wicked shall return to Sheol, all the nations that forget God, for the needy shall not always be forgotten, and the hope of the poor shall not perish forever. Arise, O Yahweh, let not man prevail, let the nations be judged before you. Put them in fear, O Yahweh. Let the nations know that they are but men. Selah. And amen. Let's remember along with David what Yahweh has done. What Yahweh has done. Notice at the very beginning, there is an, a heading here. I'm, I read from the ESV. There are actually two headings in my Bible. One is supplied by the Crossway editors, and we are free to disregard that. The other is supplied by the Holy Spirit, and we are not free to disregard it. The inspired heading is to the choir master according to Muthlaben, a psalm of David. So here we see, number one, the authorship. It is David. On what occasion it was written, we're not told. The, the, the inscription here is to the choir master, which tells us something important. This was not David's own private meditation alone. This was a psalm that was to be used in corporate worship. It was to be sung together as God's people. But it's also here, there's this maybe confusing phrase, according to Muth Laban. Now, who knows what that is? Well, I didn't either. I have to look it up. It means death of a son. And so some, some commentators have looked at this, aha, this must mean this was written on the occasion of one of David's own sons dying. That's possible, but I don't think it's as likely. I, I think the more likely thing is that this is, this is the name of a tune. You know, I looked up this, this, this morning, I looked up in our Trinity hymnal. We sang the hymn, Stricken, Smitten, and Afflicted. And you've probably, you may have already noticed this, especially in the Trinity hymnal, but some of the songs that we have in our supplemental binder, also this is the case. If you look up Stricken, Smitten, and Afflicted, you will see this phrase, Geischlich Voschlieder, Paderborn. Well, once again, I had to look it up. Geistlich Voschleiter, simply a German word that means spiritual folk song. It's a tune. Patter, uh, Paderborn is simply a town in Germany, which was the origin, likely, of the tune. So it's, it's common for us to sing hymns that there is a tune made available to us. And, the, and because of the way that the, the hymns are written with their meter, we can actually substitute sometimes one, one tune and sing it with a different hymn. I think what's happening here is David has just simply said to the choir master, as we sing this publicly, here's the tune. And because it's called Death of a Son, it's likely what we might call a minor key, meaning it's more of a somber tune. So it kind of sets the mood, doesn't it, for the hymn. But when David says, 
It's to the choir master. It tells us unambiguously that this was written to be sung by God's people. Now, if you look through the, the psalm, you, you may notice that almost all of the pronouns here are f- singular. They're first person. David uses pronouns like I, me, my. And yet, it's written to be sung corporately. I think that's instructive. Sometimes our hymns use things like we, because we are all singing with one voice together. Other times, the hymns that we sing, even corporately, have a very individual focus, because God intends for us to apply them personally in the midst of the body. Only to see in verses particularly 1 through 12, it's throughout the this, this, this psalm, but particularly in verses 1 through 12, David first recalls to mind what God has already done. And he lifts his voice in thanksgiving accordingly. Look what he says in verse 1 and 2. I will give thanks to Yahweh with my whole heart. In other words, my whole being. This isn't just my lips that are going to offer praise to him. This isn't just something where I'm going through the motions. My whole being, my outer man with my lips, my inner man with my heart is going to offer praise to God. I will recount all of your wonderful deeds. This word recount just simply means to number, literally to take a census of. So what is David doing? He's training his mind here. And I think we have an example to follow. To train our minds to think and even to number, to take a census of the wonderful deeds of God. We can apply this both individually and corporately, can't we? Even nationally, we can apply this. He says, I will recount all of your wonderful deeds. Now, Derek Kidner, in his commentary on this, points out that wonderful deeds is is a single Hebrew word. And that word is particularly frequent in the Psalms, and it's used especially of the great redemptive miracles. Well, think about the Exodus. God's divine rescue of his people. But it's also used of their less obvious counterparts in ordinary daily experiences and of the hidden glories of Scripture. So with that in mind, look look what what David goes on to say in verse 4. You have maintained my just cause. You have set on the throne giving righteous judgment. Can, Can you say that, saints? Can you you deliberately train yourself to think about what has God done with respect to maintaining my just cause? Has God ever vindicated your own name? If you're in Christ, he certainly has because he's grafted you into him. Look at verse 5. You have rebuked the nations. You have made the wicked perish. You have blotted out their name forever and ever. David, as a king here, is recounting how God has delivered him and his kingdom from all kinds of enemies. David thinks back about the Philistines and others that that God has given him a victory over. Look down to verse 10. And those who know your name put their trust in you for you, O Yahweh, have not forsaken those who seek you. If you are in Christ, this is your testimony too. God has not forsaken you. God has owned you as his own. Then verses 11 and 12, David again says, Sing praises to Yahweh who sits enthroned in Zion. Tell among the peoples his deeds. Now he's thinking corporately, not just individually. Let's let's together tell of the deeds of Yahweh. For he who avenges blood is mindful of them. He does not forget the cry of the afflicted. See, Yahweh has already told us who he is. He had told David who he is, and David believed him. He knows that God is a God who rescues, delivers, saves, and redeems. And it should have been more than enough that God said this was true. But God did more than just say it is true, didn't he? See, God, our God is not a God of mere talk, is he? God doesn't just say he's going to do something. He demonstrates over and over and over again his faithfulness. Saints, do you know God in this way? Our God is not a God who just merely says things and doesn't follow through. He's a God of activity in his creation. 
He is a God of activity and providence, ruling and reigning over all things, and especially among the people of his own name. So if you were to write a psalm, remembering his wondrous deeds, his great acts of deliverance, what would you write? If you were in Christ, surely you would testify that I was once dead in my sins. I was, in, I was a bond slave to my flesh. And God delivered me. He rescued me. I was a slave to the lusts of my flesh, and, and, and God ransomed me, and he purified me. He has set my foot upon a solid rock. And again, this is true both at kind of a macro level and a micro level, we should say. We, it's a national and an individual level. Can we look back with, with an eye on our own nation's history and give thanks to God for his providential ruling? As you read through the early days of the founding of our nation, can, can you not see with trained eyes God's providential rule over individual battles, even using unbelieving men to accomplish his will? And that's true throughout our entire history. And yet, we wring our hands now and we fret and we worry because of who's in charge now. And we think, is God not still in charge? Does God not still rule? Look at verse 7. You, Yahweh, you sit enthroned forever. Is that not still true? We think about this corporately as a, as a church body. In what way can we together recognize the great deliverances of God. How has he preserved us as a church body for 14 and a half years now? How has he repeatedly provided for us, sustained us, rescued us? Now look back at verses 3 through 6 and think about these Christologically. When, when my enemies turn back, says David, they stumble and perish before your presence, for you have maintained my just cause. You have sat on the throne giving righteous judgment. You have rebuked the nations. You have made the wicked perish. You have blotted out their name forever and ever. The enemy came to an end in everlasting ruins. Their cities you rooted out. The very memory of them has perished. Ask yourself, what wickedness has Yahweh conquered in you? Can you praise the name of God for his work of justification in you? That once I was dead in my sins, but I believed upon the name of Christ, and in that moment I was justified before God. Saints, you know that the moment you were converted, the moment you first believed, you were as justified as you will ever be. You will never be more justified than you were on the moment you first believed. Don't let anyone tell you that your justification is dependent upon your faith plus something else. Not even your faith plus faithfulness. It's not true. That's contrary to the gospel. You were justified by faith in Christ alone. And his active obedience at that moment was imputed to you. Along with all of your sins being cleansed and pardoned. Can you praise the name of Yahweh for that work of justification? And look back and say, this is what he has already done. Praise the work of sanctification up to whatever point you are. <laughs> Whatever progress you have made in sanctification, in, in mortifying sin, will you give thanks to God for that? And I know, if you're honest, if I'm honest, there's sin that remains. We know there still is an enemy that lurks within, but will, will we give thanks that God has already accomplished this in us? But David doesn't stop there. It is not only the deeds of Yahweh that David recounts that he numbers that he takes a census of it's not only his works in creation and providence that david remembers but even more david begins to pray and begins to sing about god's character about who god is fundamentally who god is essentially 
Again, let's, let's look back to his, his appeals to God's character. We see this primarily beginning in verse 13, but, but David's already references this even earlier. Back again to the beginning of the psalm. David says in verse 2, I will be glad and exult in you. Not just in your deeds, but in your person. To, to exult means to rejoice. So David says, I will rejoice in you. David prays and sings about God's character. We notice throughout the psalm, and I've intentionally read, I'm reading from the ESV, but I intentionally, everywhere it says the Lord, in, in most of our Bibles, that's in all caps. But that's, that's an editorial decision because the text actually says Yahweh. That's God's proper name, his covenant name. And so I read the psalm so that you could hear Yahweh, 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 Yahweh. You think that was important to David? You better believe it is. It ought to be important to us. David says, first of all, this is what I know about God. He's a promise keeper. He's a covenant keeper. If God swears by his own name, it will come to pass. I, I can bank on that. doesn't matter what's happening in the world around me. doesn't matter how many enemies are lined up against me. doesn't matter how, how many enemies are lined up within me. I know God keeps his promises because he is a faithful God. And he says, in that, I'm going to rejoice in you, O Most High. David grounds his hope in the very person of God. Far more, even than he, than he thinks about what God has done, although those are, are, are important for us to know, it's who God is that fortifies his strength and his hope. I found this comment from Augustine helpful, convicting as well. The ancient bishop says this, not now in this age, not in the pleasure of bodily caresses, not in the flavors of the palate and the tongue, not in sweet scents, not in pleasant sounds that fade away, not in beautifully colored objects, not in the vanities of human praise, not in matrimony and offspring that will one day die, not in the abundance of temporal riches, not in this world's getting, whether it extend in space or be prolonged in the succession of time, but in you I will rejoice and exult. That is, in the hidden things of the sun, where the light of your face, O Lord, has been stamped on us, for indeed you will hide them, says the, says a psalmist, in the hidden recesses of your face. Saints, do not ever let anyone persuade you that the doctrine of God is not important, or that anything attaining to or pertaining to the doctrine of God is of a secondary nature. You know, we live in an age where it's gospel, 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 gospel. And that's, that's vitally important, but not at the expense of who God is. What, what we would call theology proper, as we study the Trinity, as we study God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. God in one, and yet God is three. If God is not triune, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we have no hope of redemption. But look what David exalts, specifically what he rejoices in with respect to who God is. I mentioned this already, but let's look at it again in verse 7. But Yahweh sits in the throne forever. He has established his throne for justice, and he judges the world with righteousness. He judges the peoples with uprightness. What is he saying about who God is? He is sovereign. He is sovereign over all things. Not one thing in all of the created world is not under God's immediate rule and reign. Nothing is outside of God's authority. God, David says, I can take comfort in this, that Yahweh is sovereign. See, in David's day, just like ours, there would be wicked men who puff their chests out and say, I'm in charge here. And David could take comfort in the fact, no matter how many of them there were, 
how armed they were or how mighty they appeared, he could take comfort in the fact, no, 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 Yahweh is sovereign. Yahweh is the one who sits enthroned. It is Yahweh who judges the world in righteousness. But, but David's not done there. Look at verse 9. Yahweh is a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. What is David saying about Yahweh? He is immutable. He is unchangeable. Now, how do I get that? There is no advantage. There is no stronghold in a God who changes. There is, if you go to a safe place, if you go to a shelter and the rules change every time you go, where is their safety? Yahweh is immutable. I was reading a passage from Stephen Charnock in his existence and attributes of God. He's working through the character of God and he specifically cites this verse, verse 10. He says, the fear of change in a friend hinders a full reliance upon him. Don't you know that to be true? You're in your own experience, don't you know that to be true? The fear of change in a friend hinders a full reliance upon him. And we have people we may enjoy their company, but we know they're kind of a flake. I can't really depend on them because their affections for me may change, or their circumstances may change, or their ability to help me may change. The fear of change in a friend hinders a full reliance upon him. An assurance of stability encourages hope and confidence. This attribute is the strongest prop for faith in all our addresses. Did you catch that? This is the strongest argument for our confidence in God, is that he does not change. Charnock goes on, it is not a single perfection but the glory of all those who belong to his nature, for he is unchangeable in his love, in his truth. The more solemn revelation of himself in his name, Jehovah, which signifies chiefly his eternity and immutability, herein is the basis of strength of all of his promises. Therefore, says the psalmist, those that know your name will put their trust in you. Psalm 9, verse 10. Those who are spiritually acquainted with your name, Jehovah, and have a true sense of it upon their hearts will put their trust in you. You see how vital this is? You see how how necessary this is, in a sense, for our training as the people of God who know one day, if not now, we will face adversity, we will face persecution, and one of the things we most need to know is that God is unchangeable, and because of that, he is the stronghold. We will not find our rescue in the state which changes every day. We will not find our our help, our refuge, in men who change all of the time. We will not find our refuge in laws or human institutions, even our families. Why? Because they change. Nothing inside of creation is immune from change. Only God who is outside of his creation is immutable. And only in him do we find that certain stronghold. You may come to my house and be safe today, but I can't guarantee that tomorrow. This church is a safe place today by God's grace, but we can't guarantee that for tomorrow, can we? I'm talking about just the institution of a local church. But God has not changed, will never change. In him we have a a refuge that is sure and certain. But David isn't even finished there. He speaks of God's sovereignty, his immutability, but look at verses 11 through 13. Sing praises to Yahweh who sits enthroned in Zion. See, he's already said he's enthroned forever over all of creation, but now specifically he's enthroned in Zion. Tell among the peoples his deeds. Again, what deeds are we talking about here? His deeds of redemption, his deeds of salvific rescue. For he who avenges blood is mindful of them. He does not forget the cry of the afflicted. Well, who are those? We go down to verse 18, the needy 
shall not always be forgotten. The hope of the poor shall not perish forever. What is David saying about the character of God? He's saying this. He's relying upon Yahweh's mercy, his grace, and his compassion. It is not only his sovereignty and his immutability that David extols, exalts, rejoices in, but also the fact that we, he knows that Yahweh is a merciful God. He is a gracious God. He is a compassionate God. Do you know God in this way? Not, not that you've heard about him, but do you know him in this way? Do you know his mercy towards sinners? If not, on the authority of God's word, I promise you, you can know that today. You can know today his mercy to sinners. The scriptures tell us very plainly, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You will be rescued. If you believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. And see, we find David singing the word recount again in verse 14, that I may recount not only your good deeds, but I may recount all your praises. In the gates of the daughter of Zion, I may rejoice in your salvation. So this time, with respect to the character of God, he says, I'm going to recount all of your praises, meaning all of your attributes. All of who you are is going to be the source of my praise. And David says this specifically takes place, and twice he says this, in Zion. Now, why, why is that important? What does David mean when he says Zion? Well, Zion was a, was a mountain, a, a tangible, literal, historical place. But for us in Christ, it means more than that. This is the city of God. It, it's a type for what would later come, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to Matthew Henry. He said, as a special residence of his glory is in heaven, so the special residence of his grace is in his church of which Zion was a type. There he meets his people with his promises and his graces. And there he expects that they should meet him with their praises and their services. In all our praises, we should have an eye to God as dwelling where? In Zion. In a special manner, present in the assemblies of his people as their protector and patron. There, God was said to dwell, and there David would attend him with joy in God's salvation, typical of the great salvation was to be wrought at, which was to be wrought out by the son of David, who is David's Lord. See, saints, no pagan could make this claim, could they? No pagan can say, my God was redemptively and savingly present when his people assembled. No, God, no, no pagan could say that. None of the false religions of this world can say that. They are all about teaching you how to climb the holy mountain yourself, how to rescue yourself, how to improve yourself, how to earn yourself into a favor with God. All of them. Except the Christianity given to us in the Bible, which is Christ has done. Believe that and be found in him. And believe... That God is everywhere, and also his, very, his special presence is made known to us in the assembly. This is why the Lord's Day worship is so vitally important to us. And why in the context of Psalm 9, it's vital for our training in preparation for the day of adversity. Since this is true, since, since the Lord in a special manner is present in the assemblies of his people, since that's true, how does this inform our thinking about training for godliness? Training for godliness during, but, but even more so in advance of, of a hardship. Now, many of you have heard me say this before. I, I'm convinced that the Apostle Paul sanctified the use of sports metaphors and, and military illustrations, right? He used them a lot. He talks about wrestling and boxing and fighting, running, contending. He uses a lot of military, martial imagery. So think about this. Would it make any sense at all for a football player to practice only on his own 
and then show up on game day? Of course not. He has to practice with his team. Would it be of any profit at all for a soldier to drill and practice only on his own and never actually practice with his unit? I think that's what David is saying here. In Zion, where God has promised redemptively to make his presence known under the ordinances of the gospel, the Christian is called to gather with the assembled saints for the purpose of praise, but also for instruction and for training. For the certainty of that adversity which will come. This is why the Apostle of the Hebrews says, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as is the habit of some, but admonish one another, encourage one another. And then he says, and all the more as you see the day approaching. What does he mean by that? All the more as you see adversity growing. As you see timing become more difficult. See, what's our tendency when we go into that spiritual stall? Our tendency is to pull back, isn't it? What's the training we need? Push forward. Push forward into the community of faith. Push forward into Zion. Push forward into and among God's people. Now having reminded himself what Yahweh has already done, having reminded himself and us who Yahweh is, David fixes his gaze upon what Yahweh has yet promised to do. You see this? Look at the, very, the last two verses. We saw the same kind of language in, in Psalm 8. Arise. I love this. Arise, Yahweh. Let not man prevail. Let the nations be judged before you. See, David is confident that there is coming a day when all of the wicked will be dealt with. All of it. Put them in fear, O Yahweh. Let the nations know that they are but men. David understands, even as he looks back, I want to take your attention back. We're going to, we're going to retrace some steps here. Look at verse 5. I want you to notice, for you grammar folks, notice the tense of the verbs. And, and we won't get too complicated. We, we understand that verbs can be, in simple terms, past or present or future, right? David says in verse 5, You have rebuked the nations. You have made the wicked perish. You have blotted out their name forever and ever. That's all past tense, isn't it? The enemy came to an end in everlasting ruins. Their cities you rooted out. Their very memory of them has perished. See, that's all past tense, isn't it? So, from David's perspective, has all of this really and fully happened already? C can David say, you have blotted out their name forever and ever? Can, can David say from his vantage point that the enemy came to an end in everlasting ruin? Yes and no. Yes, he can say conclusively that God has defeated his enemies. But is, is it an everlasting defeat? Is it a permanent defeat? Derek Kidner, once again, is really helpful here. He, he, he says that the past tenses of verse 5 through 7 are what are considered prophetic perfects. Prophetic perfects. Now, this is a feature of the Old Testament. They describe coming events as if they have already happened. So certain is their fulfillment and so clear the vision. You hear what he's saying? David can speak about future events in the past tense. How can he do that? Because it is so certain to come to pass. He can speak of it as if 
it's already happened. Now, isn't this, this the tension of the Christian life? We live in the already and the not yet. Paul works this out, and in, 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 we won't turn there, but in, in Romans 8, when Paul's working about the doctrine of adoption, at one point he says, you have been adopted. And then, and then just a few sentences later, he says, you will be adopted. Which is it, Paul? It's both. There's an already and there's a not yet. You are already adopted into his family, and yet it has not yet been fully consummated. There comes a day when the Lord will return in righteousness. This is why I, I read from Peter at the beginning, therefore gird up the loins of your mind, be sober-minded, and rest your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you when? At the revelation of Jesus Christ. How many Christians today, maybe you count yourself in this group, if you're honest, you set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you when the right guy gets elected, when the right laws are passed, or or closer to home, when the right job is made available to you, or the right spouse, or the right behavior of your children. And that's where your hope is set. But Peter says, no, prepare your mind for battle, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober and rest your hope fully on the grace that is brought to you. And, and I think Peter, it's like a tent peg. He hammers that in the dirt deep into the ground in, ver in chapter 1, and he comes back to that point of reference over and over and over again throughout First Peter. In the midst of hardship and persecution, he, he starts the letter with, to the pilgrims, to those who have been scattered, those who have lost everything, even their homes and many of them their families, and you have no place to keep your treasure, but he says, it's kept in heaven for you, pure, unperishable, and undefiled. Well, that's good, because I don't even have a pocket to put it in now. I have no place to rest my head. And Peter comes back to this promise over and over and over again. Your hope, saints, my hope is grounded in the eschaton. It's grounded in the end when Christ returns. And, and friends, let me ask you this. How much more then are we enabled by the advent of Christ to praise Yahweh for what he has already done to deliver us? David could praise with a straight praise and a full heart. How much more can we for what Yahweh has already done? In light of the atoning sacrifice for sin that Jesus made when he nailed our certificate of debt to the cross and accomplished our redemption at the cross, how much more may we praise the true and living God for what he has already done? When, when we meditate upon our Lord's resurrection from the grave and the clear proclamation by his apostles that in that resurrection he defeated every enemy, even sin and the grave, how much more can we praise Yahweh for what he has already done? And I trust you to work these things out in your own mind as you, as you read back through Psalm 9 and meditate upon it. This is, this is our training. We, we have a pattern here that, that we, not only may we, we ought to follow in terms of our praying in the midst of wickedness and hardship and oppression and evil days. But if David could rest in the sovereignty and the immutability and the mercy and grace of his triune God, how much more can we, having seen that character of God demonstrated and proved in his promises fulfilled in sending a redeemer to us, whom God raised from the dead according to the scriptures, that we might be found in him. Again, I'm persuaded that Psalm 9 is, is, is a great help to us to train our minds for godliness, to, to shape our, our thinking, to help us, in a sense, gird up the loins of our minds so that in that day of adversity, in the day of adversity, we will know how to pray, how to rest securely in the blessed name of our triune God. So think through these, these things, saints. 
I'd urge you to go back and meditate upon Psalm 9 in, in, in your own heart and, and think about what Yahweh has done. Me- meditate upon who Yahweh is. And then as the apostles command for us to fix our eyes, set our hope on that which Yahweh is yet to accomplish. Amen? Let's pray together. Our Father and our God, we thank you for your your faithfulness. Lord, we rejoice that we are not dependent upon our faithfulness, but upon Christ's. That we have the full measure of his obedience, his perfection, his law-keeping imputed to us, along with our sins being pardoned and cleansed and washed away. I pray for those here this morning who have not yet tasted the goodness and mercy of our God. That today would be a day, Holy Spirit, that you would make yourself known. That you would make Christ known. That you would make the calling and election sure in the heart of one of your children they would glorify you and sing your praises in Zion. I pray for those this morning here in Christ that you would build us up, fortify us, strengthen us, train us for godliness. We ask this in Christ's name and by his authority. Amen.